She was the wife of two Tudor princes, the daughter of a Catholic queen who united two kingdoms, consort to a king who never truly appreciated her, beloved matriarch to the English people, a patron of Renaissance humanism and a champion for female education. I'm Alice of Sherwood and this is Six Tudor Wives on Screen, Episode 1, Catherine of Aragon. Catherine of Aragon was born in 1485. She was the youngest daughter of Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon. We think of her as completely Spanish, however her ancestor was John of Gaunt, which made her a distant cousin to Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. In 1501, the teenage Catherine came to England to marry Prince Arthur, the heir to the throne. Shortly after the wedding, the couple settled at Ludlow Castle, the traditional seat of the heir to the throne. However, just months later, Arthur would die of the sweating sickness, and Catherine, though herself afflicted, would survive. She would suffer the next seven years in an impoverished purgatory at the English court. She was hopeful to marry again to Prince Henry, the new heir to the throne. However, because Henry VII was a shrewd man, he wouldn't marry his second son to Catherine without the second half of her dowry, which her father refused to give up. Besides, there were many richer princesses he had plans to marry Henry to. Henry VII died in 1509. The now 18-year-old Henry VIII proposed marriage to Catherine of Aragon, who was 23 at the time. For many years, it seemed that their marriage was happy. However, as time progressed, they were unable to produce a healthy living child besides Mary. Nonetheless, Catherine made up for her shortcomings as a mother by following in her own mother's footsteps and became a consort the English people looked up to as a figurehead and a matriarch. In 1513, Henry left England on a French military campaign, leaving Catherine as regent. The Scots took advantage of Henry's absence to invade. Catherine, though heavily pregnant, decided to lead an army north and the English won victory at the Battle of Flodden. King James IV of Scotland fell in battle. Catherine sent his bloody coat to her husband, which he would use as a banner for the rest of his campaign. Catherine, as I said, supported female education, which was becoming more common in the Renaissance era. Henry's future wives, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Parr, would also believe that women should be educated just the same as men. Catherine had a lifelong friend in Sir Thomas More, the author of Utopia, whose daughters he educated the same as his son. Henry VIII, as we all know, was desperate to have not just one male heir, but two, so the succession was secure. After all, he was a second son, and his brother died unexpectedly. He only had one bastard son by 1525, Henry Fitzroy, the only bastard that he ever acknowledged publicly. Historians have debated whether there were other children he may have sired at the English court, for example, Mary Boleyn's two children, Henry and Catherine, but we can never be sure. England had not had a successful female monarch before now. The only female monarch that had even tried to lay claim in her own right was Empress Matilda in the 12th century. She had been backstabbed and hounded off of the throne, which had sparked a civil war. Henry was terrified of civil war, and he was terrified of a power vacuum after his own death. In the mid-1520s, when Henry VIII's eye fell on young and clever Anne Boleyn, he sought an annulment to his marriage. It took several long years trying to convince the Pope that Catherine and Henry were not legally married, on the grounds that Catherine had consummated her first marriage with Arthur, which went against a verse in Leviticus. Catherine staunchly denied these allegations, claiming she she was a true queen and the king's true wife. Though Henry offered her a comfortable retirement as a princess dowager, she refused. On 21st of June 1529, Catherine arrived at Blackfriars Monastery, where a legatine court was held to debate the legality of her marriage. There were two cardinals present to represent England and Rome, Wolsey and Campeggio, respectively. Catherine turned to Henry, knelt and delivered this heartfelt speech. Sir, I beseech you for all the love that hath been between us, and for the love of God, let me have justice. Take of me some pity and compassion, for I am a poor woman and a stranger born out of your dominion. I have here no assured friends and much less impartial counsel. Alas, sir, wherein have I offended you, or what occasion of displeasure have I deserved? I have been to you a true, humble and obedient wife, ever comfortable to your will and pleasure, that never said or did anything to the contrary thereof, being always well pleased and contented with all things wherein you had any delight or dalliance, whether it were in little or much. I never grudged in word or countenance, or showed a visage or spark of discontent. I loved all those whom ye loved, only for your sake, whether I had cause or no, and whether they were my friends or enemies. This twenty years or more I have been your true wife, and by me you have had diverse children, although it hath pleased God to call him out of this world, which hath been no default in me. When ye had me at first, 
I take God to be my judge. I was a true maid without touch of man, and whether it be true or no, I put it to your conscience. If there be any just cause by the law that ye can allege against me, either of dishonesty or any other impediment to banish and put me from you, I am well content to depart to my great shame and dishonour. And if there be none, then here, I most lowly beseech you, let me remain in my former estate. Therefore I most humbly require you, in the way of charity and for the love of God, who is the just judge, to spare me the extremity of this new court, and until I may be advised what way and order my friends in Spain will advise me to take. And if you will not extend me so much impartial favour, your pleasure then be fulfilled, and to God I commit my cause. Catherine would not recognise the legitimacy of the court, and she walked out, despite the calls for her return. Outside of Blackfriars, crowds were shouting, God save the Queen. Though Catherine would win that battle, she would not win the war. As chance would have it, two things would happen which would give Henry the leverage he needed. First, the Protestant Reformation was gradually growing across Europe, turning away from the total authority of the Catholic Church, and giving nations their own authority on religious matters. And second, Cardinal Wolsey fell out of favour with Henry. Wolsey had a stranglehold on what religious texts were allowed, so Suddenly, closeted Protestants at court were able to influence Henry VIII with texts like that of William Tyndale who prioritised the authority of England's church to the monarch. As a result, Henry decided to break with Rome, making himself head of the church in England. Now he could annul his marriages on a whim. Catherine herself was banished from court, separated from her daughter and moved from place to place for the rest of her life. Her health suffered, though she continually called herself Henry's true queen. As she lay dying in Kimbolton Castle in 1536, she sent a final letter to Henry. My most dear lord, king and husband, the hour of my death now drawing on, the tender love I owe you forceth me, my case being such, to commend myself to you, and to put you in remembrance with a few words of the health and safeguard of your soul, which you ought to prefer before all worldly matters, and before the care and pampering of your body, for which you have cast me into many calamities, and yourself into many troubles. For my part, I pardon you everything. I wish to devoutly pray God that he will pardon you also. For the rest, I commend unto you our daughter Mary beseeching you to be a good father unto her, as I have heretofore desired. I entreat you also on behalf of my maids to give them marriage portions, which is not much, they being but three. For all my other servants I solicit the wages due to them, and a year more, lest they be unprovided for. Lastly, I make this vow, that mine eyes desire you above all things. Catherine the Queen. On 7th of January, 1536, Catherine of Aragon died. Rumours abounded she had been poisoned by the Boleyns. However, given her autopsy reported a black growth in her heart, it was likely she died of heart cancer. She was buried in Peterborough Cathedral. To this day, her grave receives many visitors, especially on the anniversary of her death. You would think a woman who ruled so long, remained so determined and was loved by so many would be represented on screen with the respect and honour she deserves. Well, sometimes she is, other times the creators just kind of forgot. More often than not, every time there's a Tudor drama featuring Henry VIII, we're focusing on the king's great matter, therefore we don't actually see Catherine in her early years and the highlights of her reign. Instead, we frequently see just a sad old queen who's outgrown her use, being shunted off and forgotten about. In this video I've ranked 11 on-screen depictions going from worst to best, and if you think some performances were better than others, that's fine, you do you. These focus on historical fiction specifically, so no documentary reenactments or parodies. Wow, is this bad. I say I'm starting off with a big one, but really, this TV movie from the BBC is so obscure I doubt people would have heard of it. I don't think it has its own DVD release. I found it as an extra on the Six Wives of Henry VIII DVD box set. 
So this is the first adaptation of Philippa Gregory's terrible, terrible novel, and it's borderline unwatchable. I'll do a full review of it in the future, but for now I want to focus on how Catherine was represented. The truth is, not very well. At best she's a plot device, at worst she's a total non-entity. This is a prime example of completely ignoring Catherine of Aragon and her impact on history. She is just an obstacle to get out of the way. It's hard to give Yolanda Vasquez a proper analysis of her performance as she has but a few scenes. She's never seen outside of this giant giant empty room where she has her ladies-in-waiting sit on the floor. Even when Henry breaks from Rome and Catherine is banished, all we see of her is, is her standing alone in this very same room. And then we never see her again. We just have a quick mention of her death. Her costume is mostly accurate, especially her gabled hood, but her appearance, like the majority of other incarnations you're going to see on this list, presents Catherine with dark hair and olive skin, instead of having strawberry blonde hair and blue eyes and fair skin. I don't know how this keeps happening, we'll talk about it later, but you're going to see it a lot. I hate this series so much. I tried not to. I tried to be fair and say this is a popular thing that people want, but it's terrible if you're a history nut like I am. I know Paul Ray Winston was trying his best to sound like a proper Henry VIII, and he's everyone's favourite Cockney teddy bear, but he seems to be the only one in this series that actually cares about his performance and tries to, to get some effort in. Everyone else seems to be going through the motions, and when I was trying to get notes for this list, I couldn't stand it. I had to skip to the scenes that Catherine was in, made the notes, ran straight back to Disney Plus so I could watch Clone Wars, because I needed some quality. So this version of Catherine is just okay, nothing stands out. We have an intimate scene at, towards the beginning where we probably see the last time Henry was sexually attracted to his first wife. To be fair, we do see signs of her punishing herself physically and emotionally for not being able to produce a son. After that, she only has four scenes where she descends into an angry, bitter woman and nothing like the dignified queen she's reputed to have been. The series is so desperate for drama, she will literally back Anne Boleyn into a corner in public and establish what we already know about her character. This scene was copied verbatim in 2008's The Other Boleyn Girl, where it was better lit, better acted and better filmed. Not that the film was good, it's just better than this. Her hair is brown in this apparently, but I could swear it was red in some scenes, like her hair changed between filming or the lighting was just that terrible. She seems to wear a headdress from 1560s Italy instead of 1520s England, which is strange because she was always wearing the gabled hood. Maybe gabled hoods didn't chill well with ITV's demographics? I don't know. I hate this series, I don't care. <laughs> This feels more like a drama where instead of trying to find historically accurate clothing, they just went to the storeroom of period costumes at the ITV studios and raided them, thinking, yeah, that looks Tudor enough. And it honestly shows. Now I'm going to be nice to this Catherine somewhat and say I think she would have been better if she was in a different movie of a better quality because Anna Torrent is actually a pretty good actress. She has a good first scene where we see her distress over her final child being stillborn and Torrent manages to carry the despair that Catherine is going through. She seems like a woman who is exhausted and terrified and disappointed in herself. In real life her final child was a girl that lived a few hours but for the sake of a quick introduction it's fair to take a liberty and emphasise Henry's obsession for a male heir. We get a good scene when the Boleyn sisters Mary and Anne meet her for the first time and her presence simply commands respect. It's obvious to everyone in the court that Mary is there to be the king's mistress, but Catherine is too regal to acknowledge it publicly. We can tell that Catherine is somewhat enraged and insulted and puts Mary ill at ease as she gets her to sing for her while Anne is suppressing the desire to defend her sister. Unfortunately, her performance isn't perfect and she tends to deliver all her lines in a monotone. It's hard to tell if she's trying to be kind, genuinely welcoming or passive aggressive. I don't think she even blinks in this role. Again, she's less a character in this movie and more of a judging figure over the Boleyn sisters. To be fair, no one in this movie, apart from Kristen Scott Thomas, has been allowed to give a good performance and that's only because she always, always brings her A-game. But when we have a woman with the world against her begging her husband to come back to her and she barely raises her voice while Eric Barner won't even look her in the eye. I don't feel the emotional strain or sympathy I'm meant to feel. Much like her predecessor in the first adaptation, this Catherine disappears and never to be seen again and her death isn't even acknowledged. My guess is she decided this movie wasn't worth her time and stormed out looking for a better film.
Okay, if you haven't guessed, I don't like Philippa Gregory's works. I can't forgive what she did to Anne in The Other Berlin Girl, more on that later. And she has a strange habit of incest being so common at the English court, the Lannisters would call it overkill. The Spanish Princess is the latest attempt by stars to cash in on the Game of Thrones bandwagon, even though thanks to that terrible ending of the show, it's pretty much damn derailed. I understand that we're always looking for an opportunity to get younger people interested in history, always bring in new, fresher audiences, but this is just bad. And like I said, this is trying to be like Game of Thrones, so this isn't Catherine of Aragon. Charlotte Hope is playing Sansa Stark in Tudor England, while we have Elizabeth of York, played by the Master's wife from Doctor Who, kiss intimidating her into submission, even though the real Elizabeth of York took the widowed Catherine under her wing and treated her like another daughter. One of the biggest betrayals of Catherine, both as a character and a person in this series, is the writers do away with a debate over whether she consummated her marriage with Arthur, and say she did. So we don't spend the rest of this series thinking, is she telling the truth, is she lying? Instead, the Queen, so dedicated to truth and justice during the King's great matter, and the woman so religiously devout who fasted and admonished herself every miscarriage and stillbirth, is a liar. And I'm sorry, I just don't think that Catherine, who was so God-fearing as she was, would have lied so blatantly. This series was very badly received in Spain because of its stereotypical and what they deem insensitive depictions of these Spanish figures, especially Joanna of Castile, who's shown to be some sort of delusional lunatic. Charlotte Hope unfortunately doesn't actually leave much of a performance on me. She can be sad in a scene and play regal, but she feels more like an actress wearing a period costume than an actual person from history brought to life. And then in the second series, we have another portrayal of Catherine where we see her greatest achievement is maxed up to 11. And instead of just orchestrating the Battle of Flodden from a distance back in Buckingham, we see her riding into battle in full armor, heavily pregnant and fighting. And I'm sorry, that reeks of pandering. I know you want to get those sweet, sweet, strong female character points to reach a wide audience, but as a novelty wears off, you're just going to get a bunch of people thinking that either A, you're trying too hard, or B, you don't think a female character can be strong unless they're all literally Xena warrior princess. Yes, so big surprise, this series is not very good, and this Catherine of Aragon is underwhelming to hell. Okay, if you haven't heard of this Disney film, I'm not surprised. You won't find it on Disney+. Plus. I've checked. Well, I've checked on the British one. You might want to check the American one. I don't know. Anyway, this is a swashbuckling retelling of Mary Tudor the Elder wanting to marry for love. That's Henry VIII's sister, not his daughter. Catherine of Aragon is shown surprisingly well here. There are a lot of historical inaccuracies in this movie, but they're pretty surface layer. It's more, we're trying to tell a love story and we're fitting in the historical events around it. But if you love swashbuckling love stories, then you'll enjoy it nonetheless. So Crutchley's Catherine is only limited to a few scenes at the beginning of the film. However, she seems more authentic than the last few Catherines put together because she carries herself with so much dignity and even though this young rambunctious version of her sister-in-law is rather headstrong for her taste, she doesn't call her out in the middle of the court. She talks with a lot of authority, reminding the princess that you may be the king's sister, but I'm his wife and I have more authority than you. I think the intention here was to show a clear contrast between Catherine and Mary with old traditions contesting the new, but since Catherine disappears out of the ball scene, the theme is promptly forgotten about. By the way, keep an eye on Rosalie Crutchley. You'll be seeing her in the future video. Yes, so we have another Catherine who, again, doesn't have a big role, but this can be more forgivable this time as we're seeing the events of the King's Great Matter through the eyes of Thomas Cromwell. And as we all know, Thomas Cromwell didn't really come into power until after Wolsey failed to achieve the annulment at the Legatine Court. So I haven't seen this series all the way through. I've just been to check the performances of certain actors like that of Joanne Wally. And she seems rather authentic. She actually looks as though she's in her 40s and she's gone through a lot of pregnancies. 
one of the main scenes featuring Catherine is between her and Cromwell, where he tries to appease the adamant Catherine to settle for a retirement as the Princess Dowager. However, she refuses, obviously. Wally comes off as authoritative, looking down on the common-born Cromwell while reprimanding an ill Mary to stand up straight. In a surprising moment of compassion rarely seen in Cromwell's depictions, he fetches Mary a chair. Wally has Catherine suppressing her rage at being abandoned by Henry. Even before her enemies, she doesn't show signs of weakness. Though she doesn't voice it, she is certain that the truth is on her side. We also see, albeit briefly, her speech at the Legatine Court, which is fine for a flashback, but for a genuine depiction of Catherine, I would have liked to have seen more of it. Right, this film is one of my favourites of all time, but I'm really willing to admit that it has its inaccuracies, but for the most part it is probably the most faithful retelling of the Anne Boleyn story. Unfortunately, Irene Pappas once again falls into this usual stereotypical Spaniard appearance with her dark hair. For a film that actually shows Anne sympathetically, we see an equally sympathetic version of Catherine. She doesn't take any of Henry's nonsense when he claims their marriage is cursed, and instead of calling him out in front of the court, she simply gets up and walks out to show her displeasure. I would have enjoyed her performance more if, when we get to the Legatine Court for her marriage's validity, she actually delivers a speech as was historically recorded, instead of appealing her case to Rome and walking out as quickly as she'd entered. As a result, while we see Catherine who has suffered a lot and clawed to keep what little she has, she remains underused. Had the film been half an hour longer, she may have got more screen time. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. But just for you tonight. Now when I say six the musical, what I mean is not just one actress playing Catherine of Aragon for this entry. It is all the actresses who have played Catherine of Aragon, whether they're from the Edinburgh version, Broadway, West End or UK tour. So yes, I am ranking the musical higher than all the other Catherines so far, because this musical actually gives Catherine an equal opportunity to be represented while most of these other entries are more than willing to just shove her out of the way in favour of Anne Boleyn. Yes, yeah, so Six the Musical is framed as a concert featuring the six queens as they debate who was treated worse by Henry. Catherine has always come first. Because the musical is based on the style of several pop stars, Catherine's song No Way is like Beyonce meets Jennifer Lopez. It summarises her relationship with Henry where she has endured years of his lies and cheating. Now he wants to replace her and he expects her to just step aside. If you're lucky enough to go and watch the show, you're treated to the dialogue between the songs where the queens roast each other in amusing ways and describe their backstory. Catherine recalls how she's been used as a political pawn all her life. Every time life changes, she says an uneasy, Okay. Finally, building up to her having enough and saying, No, 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 no. I just don't think I'll look that good in a wimple. So I'm like, no way. She also has a great costume with this amazing golden black colour scheme to show her queenly heritage. The final song has the queen following their own paths in a series of events that doesn't revolve around Henry. In Catherine of Aragon's version, she rejects Henry's marriage proposal outright, moves to a nunnery and joins the gospel choir and tops the charts with hit after hit. It's a sweet conclusion to her story as she gets to enjoy life on her own terms and stops being ruled. <laughs> In a movie far shorter than it deserved to be, the six wives in this film sadly aren't given an equal amount of screen time before the next one comes along. Catherine of Aragon probably marks third or fourth in terms of screen time. However, what we do see is a pretty good rendition of her because while we don't see the entirety of her reign, we see segments along the way edging further and further towards the King's Great Matter. Remember, the framing device for this film shows Henry VIII on his deathbed recalling his wives and the events surrounding them. As a result, some events and people may be biased in his favour. So for Catherine Catherine in the early years, he's romanticising her as a beautiful woman who he married and was hopeful to have a son with, only for the very banquet where they were celebrating his birth to end with their son's death. He's practically wearing rose-tinted glasses during the happy dances and asking Thomas More to be his son's tutor. Catherine, with a surprising amount of restraint on her part, once she hears the news, without making a scene, telling him, we have to go to Richmond, and she's trying to act as a pillar of strength as she promises she will have another son. 
Like the Catherine in Anne of the Thousand Days, she also doesn't take any of Henry's crap. In a scene where Henry confronts Catherine about France's alliance with Spain, which would put England at a disadvantage, he accuses her of failing as a queen and not being able to provide a son. And she replies then, give me a healthy child, as if she says, it takes two to make a child, you idiot. We also get a good rendition of the Legatine court scene. It's a, one of her few moments to shine and it's the last scene she appears in. We see a woman who is loved, but still has the world against her. And again, because it's through Henry's perspective, we don't see Catherine walking out to greet the crowds or shouting God save the Queen. We hear it with Henry finding himself backed into a corner. So overall, pretty good, but I would have preferred she had more screen time, like, again, most of the Catherines on this list. Yes, I've got the Tudors this high on this list, and I know it's not the most popular show in the world when it comes to historical figures, but key point is the Tudors has been a guilty pleasure ever since I started studying the Tudor history for myself. To be honest, when it comes to historical accuracy, it's better than Philippa Gregory, it's better than anything she came up with. When they do focus on historical events, we do get quite an interesting show, and it's not 100% realistic, but realism is not what you're going to find in this show. It, there's a whole scene in the fourth season where we have Geralt of Rivia talking to the Phantom of the Opera, so realism has kind of gone out the window in this show. Maria Dor Kennedy gives an exceptional performance as Catherine of Aragon, and it's a true gem of this show. She won an IFTA award and a Gemini award for this performance and it definitely shows. So Kennedy definitely deserved more screen time because we start the show again in the 1520s when Henry VIII is starting to pursue Anne Boleyn. So we don't see the highlights of her reign once again. But what we do see is pretty good. You can tell every time she walks in the room that she is respected and adored by many and you see the bond she builds with her daughter and the impact her death has on Mary throughout the rest of the series. And of course her death scene has the right amount of tragedy and emotion as she's surrounded by her ladies trying to send one last letter to Henry before she dies. Another reason I rank Kennedy so high is because there is probably what is my favourite part of the entire series is in the final episode where Henry VIII is dying and as he's trying to set his final affairs in order, having his final portrait painted and saying goodbye to his family, he is visited by the ghosts of his first three wives and he has to remember all the terrible things he has done. Obviously Catherine comes first and she she admonishes him for his neglect of Mary over the years, leaving her unmarried and childless at 30, which is an insecurity you see Mary go through throughout the series. Henry cannot deal with the guilt. However, because she is dead, he has no power over her anymore. She looks him in the eyes and says, You sent me away before, though I loved you, but I was still your wife in God's eyes, and still am. You just feel that sting ripping through him. I love it. Right, so big surprise, the best performance is the one where she actually gets an entire episode all to herself. Annette Crosby's performance is extremely well done. You need to have good stage presence if you want to rival Keith Michelle's Henry VIII. This is one of the few portrayals that has put her correct hair colour, and we see a time skip between the beginning and end of her reign where we see the ravages that numerous failed pregnancies and the stress of trying to keep Henry happy has had on her, where she's covered in wrinkles and her hair has turned prematurely grey, even though she's only in her 40s. Sadly, we don't see the other achievements of Catherine's reign. It would have helped to have seen victory at Flodden and Mary's birth in a montage to show the passage of time. The first part of her episode focuses on her widowhood, where she's struggling to get by at the English court with little to no money, hoping one day that she will marry Henry. We share her relief when Henry finally shows up and says, will you marry me? Which is kind of an emotional bloke because we all know that it's not going to last. Towards the end of the episode, we also have her later life in exile, which draws a clear parallel from the beginning and adds to the tragedy of her story. She suffered in hope and was proved right before. Unfortunately, it won't happen again. This series probably shows the best version of the Legatine court scene, where she gives the majority of the speech. I'm not expecting a one-for-one -one recreation of the speech because it is quite long, but we have to keep all the main points in watching her walk out of that court after delivering that speech and saying I have nothing to do with this court and stepping out to receive her adoring public shows that she carries all the dignity that befits her title, strutting like a cool guy walking away from an explosion. It is a real treat of this series where they don't have the greatest budget and they don't have the greatest special effects but what they do have are some really great actors.
While we're still talking about Catherine of Aragon on screen, I'd like to talk a little bit more about her speech at the Legatine Court, which is usually guaranteed to appear when we portray Catherine. The only exceptions on this list have been because either the events covered did not include the King's Great Matter, or the creators decided not to include the scene at all. All six of Henry's wives have a definitive scene in most of their on-screen iterations, and because we always focus more on Anne Boleyn's rise and fall than Catherine of Aragon's, this is really the first Queen's only chance to shine. Remember, this speech was not just an earnest plea from a forlorn wife to her indifferent husband, it was a political move as well, proving that Catherine was more than a simple obstacle and she could play the game as well as any man. Henry could not cut Catherine off from her speech, lest public opinion turn against him. Catherine was convinced that she had just backed her husband into a corner. Surely King Henry, who had been dubbed Defender of the Faith by the Pope himself, would not go against the authority of Rome. As for its on-screen iterations, the quality and accuracy of these varies and is sometimes completely dependent on the actress's performance. Annette Crosby, Maria Doyle Kennedy and Francis Cuker all do the speech perfectly. Her political motivation is clear because we have built up the character of Catherine beforehand, and we see her persistence that truth is always on her side. Not only that, but we also see a range of reactions from the people observing the trial, either participating or being part of the crowd outside. Joanne Wally and Irene Pappas are adequate when they do the speech, mainly because there isn't much to criticise because their speeches are cut short, Joanne's being only in a flashback as perceived by Thomas Cromwell, and Irene's only going on for less than a minute. But seeing as it's usually Catherine's only key scene, it would at least give some credence to your period piece by featuring the speech in some shape or form. Granted, I don't expect a full recreation of the speech as it is quite long, but including the majority would at least work. Anna Tarrant and Assumpter Cerna, however, have given the weakest versions of this speech so far. For the former, because she speaks only in a monotone, and the extras gawp wordlessly as she comes in and walks out again. It's as if they put the scene in because they know it's something that actually happened in history, and not the impact it had, because five minutes later Henry decides to break from the church anyway, and it isn't a long, gruelling decision for him. For the latter, it seems more like your average pub spat in EastEnders, where Henry repeatedly tries to interrupt Catherine, even though doing so is bound to turn public opinion against him. It's setting up drama that has no consequence on the plot. I'm expecting the Six the Musical is unique in that it is more of a summary of events through the song than a full recreation. However, we do get a clear reference to her speech at the Legatine Court in the third verse. It's a great nod towards her real-life counterpart's determination and is the cherry on top of just how much Henry has mistreated her and how he has no justification for his actions. I think if you were going to recreate this scene in future iterations, you would need to build up Catherine beforehand so the audience recognises her speech for the calculated move it is. Plus, we need recreations from observers besides Henry and the two cardinals. For example, we usually see the Duke of Norfolk, who is Anne Boleyn's uncle and obviously on the side of his family, and one of Catherine's few supporters at Legatine Court, John Fisher, the Bishop of Rochester, has to get up and say, I did not put my hand to this agreement. The agreement being declaring the marriage null and void by all the bishops of England and where his signature or seal was forged by Cardinal Wolsey. Catherine's appearance is also a frequent pet peeve I kept seeing show up when I was doing these rankings. Instead of the reddish hair, blue eyes and pale complexion the real life Catherine had, the majority of these actresses have dark hair, dark eyes and occasionally tanned skin, which leaves us with a lot of Catherines that don't look like Catherine. Six the Musical does get a pass as not only does their Catherine of Aragon pay homage to non-white musical artists in personality and style, but colourblind casting is a pretty frequent thing in theatre in Britain 
So this constant misrepresentation of Catherine is confusing. Either it comes from not completely looking into the real life appearances of these people, as we do get a lot of brunette Henry VIII's as well, despite his red hair being a key feature that he would pass on to Elizabeth I, or it was made out of a general assumption of the dark featured Spanish lady that has either consciously or subconsciously bled into the creator's casting choices. Usually I don't mind if the resemblance isn't spot on, so long as the actor gives a good performance. Although I must say, this inaccuracy is a bit of a wasted thematic opportunity, because you would have a clear contrast between the pale Catherine, who has turned prematurely grey, as opposed to the young Anne Boleyn, who has features that were so uniquely dark with her hair and her eyes that Henry and a lot of other male courtiers found it completely intoxicating and Henry VIII was known to look for the opposite of his current wife when he was searching for a new one, and this was no exception. Now, I don't want to hover too much over the fine line between acceptable dramatic license and flagrant disregard of people's legacies, but it is important to stress that if a piece of fiction, especially a drama, claims to be based on true events, it has a duty to make sure they are properly represented. No piece of historical fiction is without its inaccuracies, but some are more forgivable than others. Catherine of Aragon with dark hair? Forgivable. Catherine calling out Henry's infidelity in front of the court, less so. You know, in real life, if a woman is confronting her husband about his infidelity, it's not something you'd want other people to hear about, whether they're your friends or your enemies. And it wasn't uncommon for kings in that time of history to have mistresses. I'm not condoning cheating on your wife in any way, but it was considered common practice, whether we find it deplorable or not. Annulling or divorcing was very difficult to achieve in that time of history before divorce became more of a regular thing. So Catherine would have been confident that regardless of Henry's infidelities, he would never try to get rid of her, whether she had had a son or not. After all, when she realised she was never going to have any more children, she was determined to train her daughter Mary to become a monarch in her own right. And of course, her own mother had ruled in her own right, so she had no objections to a woman becoming a monarch. It is a betrayal of Catherine's character to suggest that she was a nagging old wife that the young-ish Henry was tied down to, who was always trying to pick a fight with Henry when they were alone. And she was above calling other women whores in public, as it would give her enemies the satisfaction of showing that they had gotten under her skin. And that is something a queen does not do. She would only show emotion when it would benefit her. Catherine, as we all know, was better than that. And for the love of God, do not make a pregnant woman fight on the front lines of the Battle of Flodden. There are better ways of writing female characters without resorting to brute strength being the be-all and end-all. Catherine won Flodden because she had the intelligence and influence to rally the necessary troops and tackle the Scots head-on. She wasn't Aragorn. She wasn't seen a warrior princess. She wasn't She-Ra. She was a figurehead, much like Queen Elizabeth. Do you think Queen Elizabeth got onto the English Navy ships and fought the Spanish Armada head-to-head? -head? No. We all know she didn't. And as your popular audience fades, you're going to be getting people who enjoy studying history, they're going to rip you apart for making something so flagrantly stupid. I do hope Catherine gets better representation in the future, and all her lesser representations will be left to be judged as crazy ass fan fiction at best, or a complete disregard for her memory at worst. Thank you for watching, this has been my very first video. I've never recorded or edited or done anything like this before, but I've run out of things to do during lockdown, so might as well try this. And yes, as you can see, I like books, I like history, I am an aspiring writer. I've got a couple stories that are already on Inkit, link in the description. Also, if you want to see more of this as I move through the other six wives and maybe even beyond that, then follow me on Twitter and I'll keep you updated. And oh my god, I'm just so glad I've gotten this done. It's taken me months to just plan and edit and write this because this was all trial and error and 
the compute my computer kept freezing it froze three times in a single day because of the video because of the editing software i was using and corrupting the files so i kept having to edit the rankings in little little bits but don't let my opinion on on these dramas and pieces of fiction deter you from enjoying them and i encourage you to seek them out because some can only be seen to be believed and Again, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you all again. And again, Merry Christmas! I've earned a treat. <laughs> if I'm